uh, uh, sev several different uh, places in our Bible, but we're going to start start off in Genesis, in chapter number 17. We're going to be in, we're in, at, at some point here. We're going to be in Psalms. We're going to be in Revelation. A few other places, but uh, so all over the Bible tonight. Genesis in chapter number 17. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to meet together tonight in your name. I just ask you to bless our time together, empty me of self, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I, I pray that this message tonight will be a blessing uh, to the hearers. And Lord, I, I pray that you'll help the message be very clear. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to continue our study of the names of God in Scripture tonight, the names of God uh, in Scripture. And let's begin by reading the first two verses of chapter 17. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, notice this, I am the Almighty God, the Almighty God. Walk before me, be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and look at this, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And so, Almighty God. The Hebrew word behind Almighty God there, it's translated Almighty God in the King James um, pretty much every time in the Old Testament, if I understand this correctly. Uh, it appears 60 times, I think, total in, in our Bible. And... Uh, that might have been, it, I, I don't have it in my notes, it may have been 60 times in the Old Testament, but I'm pretty sure 60 times total in the Bible. In the New Testament, there, there's an equivalent to this. But the idea of Almighty God here is in the Hebrew, El Shaddai. You may have heard that song, that, uh, Amy Grant had a song, uh, my uh, older sister used to listen to it when I was a kid, I still remember it. Uh, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, and then I... It's fuzzy. I remember the tune. I really remember the tune. I do. It's in the chorus book. Is it in the chorus book? I gotta look this up because we, we don't do it. Which page is it, Brother Mark? You gotta tell me. Find it. Where's our fact checker? Oh, there it is. Yeah, page twelve. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Eliana Adonai. Age to age, you're still the same by the power of the name El Shaddai, El Shaddai. Now, I can't say that next one. Urkum Kana Adonai, we will praise and lift you high, El Shaddai. Yeah, that, I did remember some of those words, but I couldn't piece it all together. I was, I was little when she, I was probably seven years old, and I still remember that tune. I still remember the, I, I, the one thing that sticks out is El Shaddai. And I remember that uh, from that song, and I remembered Adonai. I remembered that word in the song. And that, Lord will, that's going to be the next name of God in Scripture that we study is Adonai. But El Shaddai, the first time it appears in the Hebrew is those two verses that we just read. That 17, chapter 17, verse 1, that is the first occurrence of the name El Shaddai in the Bible. Uh, and, and it translates in the King James, Almighty God. Almighty God. It has the idea of God being completely sufficient for us. All sufficient God would be a, a, a very good way of putting it as well. The all sufficient God. And when he says, I will multiply thee exceedingly, uh, he's basically saying, I, I, I am the God who can bless you abundantly. I, he's basically saying, you're 99 years old and you're childless, but I'm the God who can make this happen. I'm the one who can bless you exceedingly. I'm the one who can, who can uh, pour out a blessing on you. And this is the first mention of El Shaddai. So it has the idea of God's provision for His people. God provides for His people in a number of ways. Uh, let, me, let me show you. I want to take you to Psalms, Revelation, and back to Genesis. So go, turn to Psalm 37. We're looking at God's provision. 
the first mention of this name El Shaddai, he promises to provide Abram with uh, a son and to, to bless it, to, to multiply him exceedingly. And this is the that's the first mention of El Shaddai. It's the promise of Abraham's son. Psalm 37, and look at verse number 25. Is it what am I, oh I'm in Job. I'm, there is no Job 37, 25. There's a Job 37, 24. All right, Psalm 37, 25. I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Let me, let me tell you tonight that God provides for his people materially. He takes care of our, of our material needs, doesn't he? Um, I'm not saying that Christians never struggle, and I'm not saying that Christians don't ever go through rough times or anything like that, but God can take care of our material needs, amen? amen. And we can look to Him for that, and we can say, uh, Lord, will you please uh, provide uh, our needs? Lord, will you please uh, provide uh, for, our, for our bills, for our uh, food needs, for our clothing needs? Lord, will you please provide me with a job where I can go and earn money to take care of those things? Lord, will you please open the door to this? We, you know, and we can, we can pray to him and ask him to provide those things. Uh, one commentary that I was reading on this name El Shaddai, uh, they were, uh, one example they gave was George Mueller. And if you know the story of George Mueller, he owned, and he, owned he, he operated an orphanage uh, in England and uh, never traveled to raise money for it, never asked for any sort of uh, donations to it, the only person he ever asked for donations was the Lord. And he, he did that on purpose. He wasn't against raising support. He just did that on purpose to show people uh, the power of faith and prayer. And, and there, there are countless examples of where he would pray and he would say, Lord, we have nothing to feed the kids today. And, you know, a milk truck would break down right out in front of the orphanage. And, and the guy would say, hey, I don't want all this milk to go to waste. Will you guys drink it? You know, there's tons of examples like that of George Mueller. And what is that? That's God providing. That's the God of provision. And he can provide our material needs, can he? And he can take care of us materially. Uh, in this material world, uh, he can take care of us in what we need. Secondly, he provides for our emotional needs. Look at Revelation in chapter 21. Revelation in chapter number 21. Verse number 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That might be my favorite verse in Scripture. That might be. That's pretty good, isn't it? That's a, that is a awesome. I don't, I, there's not a, a word to describe that. That is an overwhelming promise. In that one verse, He's going to wipe away all tears. No more tears. No more. No more reason to cry. No more. They'll be gone. Tears of sorrow, a thing of the past. Goodbye. It's hard to get our mind wrapped around it, isn't it? No more tears from their eyes. That's the first phrase. And there shall be no more death. We don't, we don't understand a world without death. Neither sorrow. There will be no more sorrow. Nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. No more pain. Now that's an almighty God. And he is going to provide for our emotional well-being one day. Amen. I, I don't believe he promises to take care of all, all of our emotional struggle uh, in this life. I believe he promises uh, grace, and we can ask for grace to go through our emotional struggle. Amen. And, and he promises to go through things with us here. But one day he promises to even take away those emotional struggles. Isn't that amazing? That's astonishing. Not only will he go through it with us here, one day he promises to take it away. Now let that sink in. What a God of provision that is. Uh, I was, it's, that verse says no more pain. I was, uh, my kids were asking me today, Dad, does it hurt when you break a bone? 
uh, I had a friend in, in school that uh, they, they've heard me tell the story a bunch of times. We were all sitting down eating lunch. They said, Dad, tell us about your friend that broke both of his arms when he was showing you how to swing with no arms. I, I, was, I would have been in the first grade, kindergarten. I think I was in kindergarten, and my friend was in the third grade. And the reason I remember that is because kindergarten through third grade were all down that hill, and I think he was about four. He was a senior when I was a freshman in high school. So this friend of mine, he decided he was going to show us how to swing with no arms, and he <laughs> got going pretty good. I remember me and Josh Rowland were sitting right next to each other. That kid grew up in the house in Golden that, that we own. And, uh, in fact, there's a, anyway, I don't want to get off track, but uh, me and Josh Rowland were sitting there in the, in the swings, and, and uh, Luke was going back and forth, back and forth. Finally, he flew out, landed on both of his arms, and laid there and cried. I mean, cried hard. And, uh, you know, we were at kindergarten, and we were like, well, I wonder if he's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hope he's all right, you know. I would have been about five or six, and... Uh, I remember Miss Judy Smith was our kindergarten teacher. Uh, kindergarten, first, second, and third grade teachers were all, you know, there was, we were all down the hill. She was the meanest one out of the four. And she was, uh, she was the loudest one. Oh, she was. I remember one time I stuck my foot in my mouth. Uh, I said something in class that I shouldn't have said. And I remember her going, thank you, Mr. Carroll. <laughs> At that pitch, she had that pitch. Thank you. I can't even hit it. It was very high. And I remember one time, uh, anyway, she walked over to Luke. She said, Luke, get up! <laughs> high pitch. I mean, mean lady. And really, she liked the kids, okay? She wasn't, she wasn't terrible, but she just had a rough way. And Luke, Luke, get up! He said, I can't. I, I, my arms are... Turned out both of them were broke. I remember going over to his house. I think he was stuck like this for six months. <laughs> With his arms in the it's not fun. They were asking me if that hurt. Did that? I'm certain it hurt. I watched him cry. I, I broke my leg one time. That hurt. I got my kids and I, I, I started kind of taking their arm and just kind of bending it backwards a little bit. I said, tell me when it starts to hurt. And it started, you know, ah, you know, Ka Kaylee, ah, Darren, no, you can't hurt me. They're terrified of pain, aren't you? Pain's no fun. It isn't. That verse promises to take away all pain. Amen. That's amazing to think about. No more broken bones. No more, no more stubbing your toe. No more cutting, cutting yourself by accident. I don't understand all that. I don't understand how all that's going to work in heaven, but no more pain. That's amazing to think about. It's the Almighty God. You, you have to be the Almighty God to do that. To take, away, take care of all emotional struggles. Thirdly, he's going to provide for us, he provides for us spiritually. Uh, in Genesis in 22, verse 8, I thought of this verse because I was listening to a, a sermon by Adrian Rogers, me and the kids earlier in the week, I think Tuesday, we were riding in the van together, we were listening to a sermon by Adrian Rogers on this chapter. And this verse stood out to me. Verse number 8 says, And Abraham said, My son, because Isaac says, Hey, where's the lamb for the offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. What a God of provision, amen? He provides himself a lamb. And then later on, John the Baptist says, Behold, the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. What a God of provision, amen? What an, what an El Shaddai. The last mention of this equivalent in the New Testament, the last mention of El, basically El Shaddai is also in Revelation. Look at uh, Ch Revelation chapter 19. This will be the last mention of it, of this equivalent. It's translated Almighty God. In Revelation chapter 19, this is the, this is the Armageddon chapter. And verse number 15 says, And out of his, that's Jesus' mouth, goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath, there it is, 
of Almighty God. And isn't it ironic, the last mention of this phrase, Almighty God, is in reference to people who rejected His provision. Isn't that amazing to think about? This God who provided the perfect Lamb, and the last mention of this God, of, of Almighty God, is uh, Him dealing with people who rejected the Lamb of God. And it's, it's the wrath of Almighty God. The name El speaks of God's almightiness. The name Shaddai is very interesting. It speaks of God's exhaustless bounty. It's exhaustless. It has no end. It's a bank account with no end. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine that. The richest people on the planet, Bill Gates, you know, George Soros. I don't, I don't keep up with all of them. Those are just two of the more famous ones that I've, I've run across. Uh, Elon Musk. Am I saying that right? Is it Elon? Yeah, Elon. Elon. I, I always want to say Elon, but I hear other people say Elon. Uh, man, he's a rich dude. But their bank account has a... It, it ends. You know? It, it has an ending. God doesn't have that problem. Amen. I can't even imagine that. I can't imagine that. I've never, I've never not had some sort of financial struggle. It's different in degrees and things. But he doesn't struggle financially. He, he has no struggle. Now, he understands our struggles, but he doesn't have this problem. He made the gold that backs it up. He's the one that made the oil that backs it up. He's the one, uh, you know, we're struggling with gas prices. He, he's not worried about that. I mean, he, he, he's with us in our, in our concerns. But he, his, his uh, supply is exhaustless. He, he made the, the trees that we cut down, that we sliced into paper to print the money on. It's exhaustless. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He has no trouble with, with uh, materially. He's not, he's not going, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do for the American economy. I don't know what I'm going to do. And he can take care of us, amen? Even if everything else is falling apart, I believe he can take care of us amen. and provide for us. He's the God, God of provision. Uh, look at uh, Romans in, in chapter 5, in verse number 20. <clears throat> Very famous verse. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Amen? How's that for provision? Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. How's that for limitless How's that for exhaustless bounty of God? Amen? I'm glad His grace abounds past our sin. Aren't you? This is, this is, one, this is one of the main reasons. There's tons of arguments for eternal security and why we believe that you can't lose your salvation. But I mean, think about this. If you could lose your salvation, it would either mean that there is a particular sin that would cancel it out, that would be bad enough to cancel it out, Let's say murder. Murder is probably the worst thing in the Bible because you're ending a person's life. You can't undo that. There's no fixing that. There's no, you know, in the Bible, if you killed a man's ox by accident or something like that, you had to repay him and all that stuff. There's no making that right. A life ends. You see? David got forgiven of that. Moses was forgiven of that. Saul of Tarsus was forgiven of that. Lots of people have committed murder and actually have been forgiven of that. So it's not an unpardonable sin. So it, it, you're going to have a hard time making an argument. There's a particular, there is one unpardonable sin. I believe it's rejecting Jesus Christ. It's rejecting the Holy Spirit of God. That's right. That's what it is. And no Christian's going to do that. They already haven't done that. They've already received the Lord. So when you're talking about a, a sin to cancel out. 
then you can make the argument, maybe there's an amount of sin. Maybe you commit enough of these sins and it cancels out your salvation. The problem with that is, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. It overwhelms it. Because He's the God that's providing the salvation. He's the one. It ain't about you. It ain't about how good you're doing. It ain't about how, how good of a person you are. All those things are important and wonderful things. But you can't earn it. It's by His grace that we're going to heaven. Amen? Because it's His grace that where sin abounds, His grace does much more abound. And His grace trumps it. He's the God who provides. And His provision is exhaustless. I wanted to throw this in. Uh, I, I didn't want to uh, ignore this. It's, uh, it's a little strange to say, and I want to be clear. But when you say should I, it's S-H-A-D-D-A-I. Okay? The first four letters of it is shad. Shad, in the Old Testament, translate as breast, over and over, tons of places, it translates as breast. The idea here is, have you ever, any of us ever seen a screaming child that's hungry, a baby, a newborn? I took, I took my boys out to eat Chinese the other night because the girls were having a girls night out. They were doing fun stuff like decorating for parties and stuff. So me and the boys... Uh, they, they wanted to have Chinese, so I, we had a little boys' night out. The people sitting right in front of us had a newborn. I don't know how old, but it, it couldn't have been more than just a couple of months. And they were enjoying their meal and all that. And then all of a sudden I hear this, Oh, it's pathetic. It is so pathetic when newborns try to, try to cry, because they can't yet. It's like they're, this baby was, was little, little, and, and it's just this tiny, and the mom starts stirring, you know, she's embarrassed. I just think it's cute, you know. I'm just like, oh, it's such a cute noise. I haven't heard that. It's not annoying, you know. It's not loud enough to be annoying. It's, And then she put the baby up on her shoulder like this, and I could see the baby. <laughs> you know, you know, they're so young, they can't, and they got to keep moving their lips. You know, you know the age I'm talking about, Brother Mark? They're really little. They don't know how to keep their lips still. And they're hungry, so they're going, And they would just look at me like, Can you feed me? <laughs> the idea here... Okay, so when you, when you feed that baby, when the mom feeds that baby, when that baby has a, a bottle, or that baby gets the milk, how quiet does that baby get? How satisfied is that baby? They're satisfied, aren't they? They're like, oh, this is good. This is good. Let me focus on this. Johnny uh, showed me a video of this guy that built a, a, a goat feeding machine, a baby goat feeding machine. How many bottle, uh, uh, bottles of milk would you say that was? Maybe a dozen? Something like that. He, he built this wooden feeder and he stuck these bottles uh, with, a, with a nipple through, the, through this hole. And he went and let these baby goats out. I mean, they about tackled him. It was the cutest little video you'll watch. These baby goats running. And they all start hitting these bottles. And, man, they go to town on these bottles. Amen? There's no noise. There's no, there's no complaining. There's no crying, right? At first there was. At first they were begging for a bottle. At first they were begging for food, right? And then they got filled. Amen? Malachi chapter 3. Look at it really quick. Let's look at a few more passages. Ma Malachi chapter number 3. God has the ability to bless us more than we expected. Malachi in chapter number 3 and verse number 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now therewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and look at this, and pour you out a blessing. That 
there shall not be room enough to receive it. You know, we cry out to God. And we ask God to provide. And we ask God to help us. And we ask God to meet our needs. And there's nothing wrong with those things. That's, that's like a baby crying for mama's milk. And God has the ability and power to satisfy it. Amen? He's the God of provision. In fact, this verse explains He will pour out a blessing. That, that word pour has the idea of pouring a liquid. Okay? Pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. It will overflow your cup. 2 Kings chapter 4. A few more passages. 2 Kings chapter number 4. Verse number 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels of, of broad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. You better make sure you get as many as you can. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. What a blessing that is. Amen. Did God provide? Mm -hmm. He has an exhaustless bounty. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hey, it wasn't they ran out of oil. They ran out of vessels. And then the oil stayed. Only when they ran out of vessels. It wasn't that God didn't have enough to fill the vessels. It was that they, they, they had a certain amount of vessels and that was it. Man, I bet you she's going, why didn't I try to find more vessels? <laughs> I'm sure she found quite a few here. And, and I, I believe it probably took care of her the rest of her life. But uh, I, I'm sure she's going, man, I, you know, Jim down the street, he might have had a couple of vessels. And, and uh, Dolores... Uh, you know, at, at the bakery, she might have had one or two vessels. Ah, oh, I should have stopped by there. Because it wasn't God having a problem. Amen? It wasn't God having a provision problem. How about John in chapter 4? A couple of, couple of passages, passages in John. John in chapter number 4. Verse 14. Jesus promises the woman at the well, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now how does that satisfy? That's pretty satisfactory, isn't it? John chapter 6. Verse 9, Jesus saw the multitudes, he saw the 5,000, he wanted to feed them. Verse number 9, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. So 5,000 men, we don't know how many women and children. Verse 12, when they were filled, when the 5,000 men plus women and children were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. What a crazy statement. All he had was five loaves and two fishes to start with. What do you mean what's left? Come on, Jesus, come on now. Don't you know? Five loaves and two fishes, that might feed a couple of people. I said when they had... We're filled. 
It takes a lot to fill me up. Anybody else in here ever struggle with an appetite? Huh? Wanting to eat too much? It says these people were filled. They didn't just get a little bite to sustain them. It says they were full. And there were fragments to gather up. It says verse 13, Therefore they gathered them together and filled, there's that word again, twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Twelve baskets. Full. Isn't that amazing? That's the God we serve. Amen. We have a God that can provide all of our needs above what we even imagine. I don't even know what he did there. That's what bugs me about this. It doesn't bug me. It's a good kind of bugging. But it's like, what did you do right there, Lord? Like, how did you do that? Like, did the disciples catch on at any moment? I mean... You start off with five loaves of bread and two fish. And before you know it, everybody's ate and they, they feel full and you're taking up leftovers. Did it ever dawn on them? Did it ever click? Hold on, where's all this food coming from? We don't have any... There's, there's no verse in here that says, and God said some magic words, and God took... There's nothing like that. The miracle happened when no one was even paying attention. Right? Can you look back at your life and your walk with the Lord and go, I, you know, I really don't even know. I really just taking care of me. He's just provided. I don't even know where it came from half the time. It's just, He's taking care of me. He's provided in one way or another. Sometimes money just popped up. Or sometimes a door opened to a job that I needed. And I don't know why it opened. I, I don't know what happened there. I, I prayed about it and the door opened. And then sometimes uh, it, it just I uh, somebody uh, decided not to cash a check that I had written. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, the IRS contacts you and says, Hey, you overpaid by $250. Here's stuff. I'm telling you, stuff happens. Amen. Is anything too hard for God? He is El Shaddai. He's the God who provides. That's the thing, that's the thing that Jesus asked Abraham. Is anything too hard for God? Is anything too hard? We serve the God who provides. I want to ask you to take a minute, bow your head, close your eyes right where you're at.